I would like to welcome Jeff Browning to Emirates Podcast. This is the second part of uh, interview we had earlier. If you didn't get to listen to the first part, please do. Uh, we talked about uh, Jeff's uh, dabbling into a running ultra and so many other things. Uh, one of the things that came out of there was a uh, talk about the diet that uh, Jeff is big into diet, uh, keto diets and all kind of diets. And I'm always interested to listen to to that I'm, as I'm training for Lake Martin 100. And I'm trying to uh, figure out how do I finish this time? Because last time when I ran Lake Martin, I had to stop uh, part injuries and I'm always suffering because uh, I'm not properly eating properly and so on. So, so Jeff, let's, uh, let's talk about the keto diets. Uh, uh, the, the diet that helped you to change your running. You talked about that in the previous section of this podcast. Let's talk about it then. Yeah, uh, you know, in 2000, late 2015, I, I was um, kind of on a whole foods organic diet. I've been kind of a high carb athlete for about 15 years. And, uh, but I was eating, I wasn't eating a bunch of processed food, but, you know, I, I definitely was eating a pretty high carb diet. And, you know, I hit my mid forties and I just wasn't thriving anymore. I wasn't recovering like I used to. I was starting to, you know, I liked running hundred mile races, but I was getting such an inflammatory response after the race that I was just, I was, I, it was really hard on me for about a week. And, uh, I'd even, you know, I'd even mentioned to my wife that I would, might, might be about time to retire, um, from actively racing hundreds and trying to race so hard, um, until I came across, um, I was having some health issues, um, in late 2000 or in 2015. Um, we think it was, you know, it was candida, which was like yeast in the GI track. And after some international travel and, eat, and drinking some questionable water, um, and some other things, you know, that's the only thing I can point to that might've triggered it, but I just was not, I was having, definitely having some issues and I kept having a rash and a flare up and I, I, I'd gone to a naturopath and I'd gone and, and kind of gotten some tests done and I had, I wasn't really figuring anything out and it, and it drove me to do some dietary research, um, in late 2015, December of 2015. And I, I spent about a, a about a week, uh, probably 30 hours with 25, 30 hours with the research, just looking into anti candida diets. And, um, I kept coming across, well, candida is yeast and yeast feeds on sugar. Mm -hmm. So I kept coming across high fat, low carb, keto and paleo forums that were talking about, well, don't you, you can't feed the yeast. So I started, I sat, you know, I pushed away from the table and I looked at my wife and I said, I think I need to kind of do a paleo diet. And she was like, well, I have two paleo cookbooks. And uh, she'd been wanting to do it for a few years, and I had kind of resisted because I needed my uh, carbohydrates, and because I was an endurance athlete, I needed my carbs. That's natural. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to give up my carbs. Um, but I, I started. I immediately called Zach Bitter, who's a friend of mine and was a teammate at Ultra, and uh, he put me in contact. He gave me some tips, and then he put me in contact with Peter Bet. Peter Defty at Vespa, and um, we started chatting about uh, optimized fat metabolism and OFM, which is using a ketogenic diet initially to get fat adapted and, and really go low carb. So I went really low carb keto um, for, a, for probably about a month and a half, um, or probably 10, 12 weeks, actually, where I went pretty strict. Um, and that cleared up the candida issues like i was the rashes and everything cleared up put it in remission um and uh and then i also you know started doing some reading on on fat adaptation and optimized fat metabolism and started talking to peter and that really kind of opened the door for me to start manipulating my lifestyle diet to help with performance and um, what I found was, especially as a master's athlete at the time, I think I was 44 years old at the time, um, I was having trouble getting down to race weight. Mm -hmm. You know, I gained weight easier um, in the off season or in lower volume blocks of training. Um, I'd have trouble getting down to my original weight. I used to be able to get down to in my 20s and 30s um, when I'd race. So I, uh, you know, I, I found that I lost 
eight pounds on uh, on doing it, and I got I got pretty lean, um, leaner than I'd been in twenty years. Um, <laughs> even like, ultra running, um, I, I never was that lean, and and that leaned me up. Um, I also was able to start doing two to three hour runs, no calories, uh, um, just some salt and water or, or electrolytes and water, and uh, and started playing around with that diet for um for a while and raced hurt 100 in hawaii in 2016 about seven weeks into that adaptation phase of like going pretty low carb and then i brought back strategic carbs around my workouts and strategically on long run days brought back simple carbohydrate iv drip of calories but less per hour so i used to do push about 300 calories an hour during racing and i was able to go down to less than 200 calories an hour uh and to race on and not have any lows, not bonk. I kind of quit bonking altogether. Um, I did, you know, I don't think I've had a major bonk since then. Mm. Um, except for something like Western States last year where I blew up my quads. Um, <laughs> and that, that was more being stupid and racing too fast early um, and getting caught up in the race. But, but point being, that um, I really saw a, a benefit not only in um, not having bonk, kind of becoming bonk proof and, and using less calories per hour, which equals less GI stress, um, you know, less upset stomach, no pit stops anymore, you know, multiple pit stops during a hundred, um, those kind of things kind of cleared up. Um, the other, the other thing I, I kind of found was, um, and Zach Bitter had emailed me, uh, right before or right before hurt 100 with my first hundred on it on OFM. And he said, get ready for the recovery. It's going to kind of blow your mind. Mm. And I kind of was like, well, well yeah, I didn't really believe, it. <laughs> you know, I was just like, okay, whatever. Um, but I, as soon as I got done racing, I like the difference. I had 22 hundreds under my belt when I did this. So I had finished 22 hundreds. So I had, I knew what I felt like after a hundred. Um, and I just didn't have the swelling, the inflammation. I didn't have any of the the typical symptoms that I associated with hundred milers, post hundred milers, yeah. um, that just went along with the territory. Like I just thought it was part of running hundred milers. What I realized was there was something else there. And because I didn't have quite, I didn't have as much swell. I had some micro swelling, but I didn't have crazy swelling in my ankles and knees like I in, like I normally did. I wasn't inflamed as in the face. Like I always had some puffiness in my face. Um, I kind of had a little brain fog for a week um, after the 100 miler. Um, and I didn't have any of that. I was doing 72 hours after the race, I was doing air squats wow. and uh, and burpees. And um, <laughs> and I, I mean, at the pre-race or at the post-race awards, so I finished racing on like Sunday morning at like 3.30 in the morning. Mm -hmm. And the awards are Monday night. So that would be what? Uh, less than 48 hours later. So I guess less than 48 hours after finishing, I was doing air squats and, and burpees um, because I was just freaking out. I was just like, <laughs> I can't, like, I've never felt like this after a hundred before. Like I'm not, I'm hardly swollen. I'm hardly even sore. And I've done <laughs> of downhill, um, you know, in a technical course um, and at a really hard effort. And so I, I really, because I mean, it was a it was a pretty competitive year that year. We had a dry year. Gary Robbins was the kind of defending course record holder. Was there? Um, Yassine Daboon was there. Uh, um, Avery Collins was there. So we had a pretty good contingent of good runners, men runners in the, in the men's field. And um, I just kind of felt great. Took the lead at mile 27 and never looked back. Um, and just felt amazing. And, um, and I, I was hooked after that. I was like, Oh my gosh, the recovery after this, it's, <laughs> I felt like I was 20 years younger. And so the inflammatory response, and I've seen that after coaching it, you know, I've coached, you know, probably a hundred athletes at this point to the, to do this. Um, I really, they have the same, and a lot of it's, you know, older runners who are like 40s 50s even 60s that i've coached who have like you know they get to that point where they're like man i just don't recover like i used to and then all of a sudden they go through this whole ofm 
protocol and and then they go to their first race and they get done and they're oh my gosh like, like i've never felt like this like i'm recovering so fast um so that was a huge kind of push for me to stay on it too um i did find in the first couple of years i if i if i strayed to, a good thing for me i if i strayed too far with too many carbs i would have that flare up with the candida so it kept me it kind of kept me on the straight and narrow but it kept me on the straight and narrow long enough that um, I haven't had a major flare-up in a long time, but but I I just feel so good on it that I just don't I don't want to go back to the old way, um, yeah. and I that's the testament of this. You know, there's a lot of people out there who will say, oh, there's nothing to this, there's no science to it, or whatever. I and mean, we do have some science to it now. Now I would argue that some of the science, the way they design the the studies, aren't really appropriate to how we do it. Um, you know. But the race, the elite race walker study, especially, um, I would argue wasn't done right um, in, in the way we personally do it. All the athletes I know that I coach, all the athletes I know that do it, like Zach Bitter and uh, another good OFM athlete is uh, uh, um, Nick Curry, who just got the American record on the track for 24 hours. Um, he's another OFM athlete, you know we definitely strategically bring in carbs during the big blocks of training and strategic and still use carbs on our long r runs and races. Um, we are not ketogenic all the time, 24 seven. So um, again, I'll emphasize that we are not ketogenic 24 seven. We use it strategically <laughs> here and there as a tool. So, um, you know, I, I think that's, that was the biggest aha moment for me. That was just so, uh, just the recovery was amazing on it. I felt good on it. It was easy to maintain a good, healthy, lean body weight. Um, and I feel great on it. I have great muscle tone, you know, muscle mass. I don't lose my muscle mass, you know, I'm 50 years old and I still have good, good muscle tone. And, you know, and that's one thing you really fight as you age is you lose your muscle. Um, you know, we cannibalize muscle and, and our muscle protein synthesis slows down at the age of 35. And, we, we lose on average about a pound of muscle a year after the age of 35. Um, so even if we maintain the same body weight, we are, we are losing muscle mass, which means we're getting fatter. So as runners, so, you know, keeping muscle and building muscle and having lean muscle weight is a really important thing for strength to weight ratio as a runner. Definitely. So talk about, uh, your, your diet and, um, the way you, you apply, tell us about in context of, um, like when you ran a blood rock here, uh, how did you manage it? How many hours did you run this time? I know it 22, was, 22, 35. 20, it was a tough course. I, I ran, yeah, I ran 50, 50, 35 miles of, of that course and was, you did it three times, but, um, but uh, tell us about, uh, in, you know, when you, when you ran, uh, you know, hundred mile, like, like hard hundred mile, like, um, um, a blood rock or you know you you run other bigger races tell us about how do you manage those and you for for a hundred mile or those diets um for, hundred, for me i i'm just uh i use a, a kind of an I, iv drip of carb calories i use goo roctane um in a bottle um one scoop so 125 calories between every aid station and then i carry a few strategic gels i i use here and there um, I eat a little, little fruit at the tables, um, maybe a little broth at night. Um, I keep it pretty simple. Um, I do use some electrolyte tabs like succeed caps. Um, I use those, um, per half liter. So I take a pill every half liter, um, that I consume of liquid. Um, so I'm, I'm going on about 280 to 200 calories an hour most of the time. Um, and then, like I said before, about 600 to 800 milligrams of sodium per liter of drink rate. Um, or you could look at it per half liter of drink rate, three to 400 milligrams of sodium per, per uh, half liter. Uh, so that's kind of my protocol in races. Um, as far as everyday diet, um, which most people are asking me a lot of questions about everyday diet, um, most of the time it, I'm, I'm, I intermittent carb fast in the mornings i work out at lunch most of the time during the midweek my midweek runs are lunch runs so i don't run until about 11 or 12 mm -hmm. um every day so in the mornings i usually have coffee with a little heavy whipping cream probably three eggs um cooked in butter 
uh, and then I sip on some electrolyte drink that morning, um, a product called Element, LMNT, um, and it's just it's just sodium, potassium, and magnesium um, with a little bit of stevia for sweetener and taste um, for different flavors. And I usually just drink that throughout the morning as I kind of two fist coffee. Um, and then, uh, I work out at lunch and then I eat my first, uh, full meal, like carbs, which would be carbs and protein, um, after that workout. So about two o'clock in the afternoon. So I, I haven't had any carbs since the night before when I go into that workout. Um, unless I'm doing speed work, I might eat like a, a piece of fruit, like a banana or something, you know, an hour before a hard workout, if I was going to do speed work. Like yesterday, for example, I did a big hill workout um, at lunch, and I had a banana about an hour before. Um, and I'll take a Vespa um, CB25 before a hard workout like that, um, which helps con- some fat oxidation as well. And then um, just kind of drink a little. Yesterday, I didn't even take anything with me for a two-hour workout. And it's it's cool enough here right now in the winter that um, I didn't even carry water or electrolytes or anything for that two hour workout. Um, but then I'll eat, you know, like salad and meat for lunch. Sometimes, uh, you know, then I'll have maybe some fruit too with it because I've just had a workout. So top off glycogen. Um, and then evenings are usually, uh, kind of low. Sometimes it's, I usually, my wife does a thing called, um, fuel separation method, which is, uh, letting, Protein's a constant, but depending on the protein source, it drives the pairing of carbohydrate or fat. So if you have a fatty cut of protein, like hamburger, steak, something like that, it has naturally high fat in it, then we, then we do a low carb side mm-hmm. with it. But if we had, uh, you know, say a lean protein, like skinless chicken breast or tuna or something like that, then we would have more carbs with it, like potatoes, sweet potato, or something like that. And then low carb, like some kind of a a veggie side too. So pretty much always a veggie side with my meals, my lunch and dinner meals. I always have veggies and meat. Um, but sometimes I'm strategically adding fruit or sometimes I'm strategically adding starches like potatoes for my carbs. Um, depending on how hard the workout was that day, you know, if I did a speed workout, there'd be more carbs that day, um, between fruit and starch. And if, if it was like an easy, shakeout run day like an hour run pretty low intensity i would probably go pretty low carb that day um i'd probably still have a little bit of fruit after the workout but that would be about it i'd probably probably have a low carb dinner um but i also err on the side of a little more protein so i i do what you call what i like to call carnivore keto um which means erring on a little more protein than the keto protocol calls for Mm -hmm. um bigger portions of protein um, because any excess protein that you consume as an endurance athlete will top off glycogen because your body has a metabolic flexibility of converting excess protein in the system through gluconeogenesis will convert that extra protein to glucose, um, without affecting your blood sugar. So, uh, you know, a lot of my athletes that are kind of pretty low carb, um, eat a decent amount of protein, um, pro- a lot more than it's called for by keto. Got it. Um, definitely. That's a lot to take on. Um, I, definitely. I need to learn a little bit more. Uh, one of the other thing, one of the thing I was thinking like, how do you calculate all those? Um, especially when you're running middle of the night or, you know, hundred mile or hard to calculate where, where, how to, hard to know which mile you're on, then you got to calculate how many calories you got to take. So that'll be, yeah, I don't even, I don't, I don't even calculate during a race. I just know that I drink, uh, you know, 125 calories between every aid station. Um, and just carry that powder in in a pocket. Yeah. Put it in like sandwich, you know, like the, the fold over sandwich bags, the little Mm -hmm. ones you can buy. I just put a scoop in that for my bulk powder and I tie it overhand knot and that's a serving. I tear it open, put it into my bottle and, have them t- top it off water in the aid station. So I always have two bottles or yeah, two same. flasks and one has calories and one has water. And I always sip them equally. I sip the calories, sip the water, wash away the sugary taste. So you don't get taste fatigue. Um, and then I strategically use, you know, gels here and there and a little bit of 
solid food at the tables, but I stick to real food. So potatoes or fruit, potatoes, broth, super simple. Definitely. Yeah, that's uh, something I really need to focus on. Um, when I was a younger, you know, a few years ago, uh, <laughs> AIDS, you know, we, we ate fast. Uh, just like when you're a child, <laughs> when you're a child, you did they go fast. Like when, when our age, we, we ate faster. So I need to, I need to really get on, on that. Um, I would like you to talk about a little bit about training. Uh, you, you mentioned many different trainings you do, including speed training, which, uh, in a running hundred mile, a lot of time we think like there's no, no need for speed and you just need endurance, go long and go hard and, you know, go hills and go mountains and, and so on. Uh, tell us about the training, the training cycle and, um, uh, uh, your, and your training, how, how do you train yourself or train your athlete? Uh, let's talk about a little bit as part of, part of our last part of our interview. Yeah, well, I mean, as far as um, athletes go, it's very unique to each athlete because I, I need, you know, I kind of take into consideration their their historical endurance training background. So some people are newer to the sport. Some people have been doing it for 20 years. So everyone can handle different amounts of volume and intensity. Some people can't handle any intensity and they just need to be running aerobic mm -hmm. um, and running conversational pace all their runs because if every time you give them speed work, they get injured. You know, so those kind of people, they need time to let strength training and mobility and other things kind of take hold before they can handle any harder work. Um, if I look back at the history of my training, the first five years, I couldn't handle any speed work. I would have I've got in, I would get injured. So, you know, it, it's all relative and in context. But as far as mine goes, um, once I kind of got through all those injury phases in, you know, starting in about 05 or 06, 07, I really was able to start adding in speed work after I kind of fixed everything with strength training and some mobility work. Uh, you know, my typical training is six days a week of training, one day off. Um, uh, usually my, I, I do my long runs on Fridays. So usually Fridays are a long run. Mondays are a pretty longish run you know, medium distance, long run, um, sometimes Saturdays if I'm in a big training block. So I'd have a Friday, Saturday block of bigger training. I usually take Sundays off. Um, and then I train Monday through Saturday, most of the time, occasionally I'll take a Saturday off and run Sunday. Um, you know, I kind of play by ear on the weekends with the family cause mm -hmm. I've got three kids and a wife and you know, there's sometimes there's stuff going on on Saturdays and I can't squeeze in a run. Um, and so I'll just wait till Sunday. Um, and then, uh, you know, usually two, one day a week is some kind of quality most weeks, not every week, but, you know, I usually give myself a, a, an easy week every third week or fourth week. Um, but I do some kind of, some kind of quality work once a week, sometimes twice a week, depending on the training cycle. If I'm in an active long run build where I'm building the long run every week, I'll do a little like less speed work like once a week. But if I'm in off season, where I'm doing kind of just a standard like placeholder long run, two or three hour long run, just to keep it in there. Then I, then I'll do a little more speed work coming into the season. Um, right now I'm, I'm about two and a half weeks out, uh, from, uh, a hundred K in Malibu, a Sean O'Brien hundred K. So, um, I've, I've been doing a fair amount of speed work. I've been doing, big run, long runs you know i put in an 80 82 mile week last week with uh i don't know 12 13 000 feet of climbing um and uh and some speed work so um last week was a pretty big week uh, i'm nearing the end of that i'm about ready to taper starting next week i taper so this is kind of my last big weekend this weekend and then i'm kind of going to shut it down so um usually taper for about two weeks um you know, about 13 days, 12 to 13 days, um, depending on the training cycle and what's coming up and how I'm approaching that race. Some races are a little more trainers and others are really like, you're really focusing on them. So, uh, that kind of gives you like a ballpark. I'm probably like my ballpark mileage is, you know, I live at 7,000 feet. So, and I train pretty much 80 to 90% plus trails and, and, and I train up to about nine to 10, 11,000 feet at times, um, or from like 4,000 feet to 9,000 or 4,000 feet to 7,000 feet in the winter. 
because we go down to Sedona down lower where we can run on dirt and not in snow. Mm -hmm. Um, so it depends on the time of season too, on what I'm, what, what my training ground looks like. Uh, so that kind of gives you like a, a, a kind of smattering. Like right now I'm going to Sedona a lot for long runs because there's no snow down there. Um, and I can kind of drop down into the desert and do a good long run. Like I'm going there tomorrow for a long run and, uh, it'll be technical, but more runnable type of terrain. You know, I might get 3000 feet of climbing in a 20 miler. Um, but so what, you know, so, so what is a long run for you for a hundred K you're training for correct? So, uh, my, my sweet spots have been, I, my longest run so far in the build up for this has been 25 miles. Um, 25 miles with about 25 miler with about 5,000 feet of climbing, hmm. uh, and, or 5,800 feet of climbing. Um, that was my longest run. That was last Friday. Um, but I kind of did a block. So I, you know, I did, uh, I did that run and then I did, a a long run, a longer run on Sunday and a long run mm. on Monday. So I did like 14 on Sunday. So I did 25, took a, uh, eight, ran an easy seven miler shakeout run on Saturday, ran a 14 miler, um, on with some pickup, like with like steady state effort, like a, about a, about a 40 minute steady state effort at the end of the workout. And then, uh, uh, Monday ran 18. Um, no, excuse me, 16. Um, no, it ended up being 18. I don't know. I think it was 18. Um, but it kind of gives you like, I did kind of, a, yeah. you know, I did 60 plus miles in four days. Um, so I did kind of a, a block and then I took an easy, easy day on, or I took a rest day on Tuesday this week because I'd kind of trained like nine days in a row. Um, and then I took a rest day on Tuesday and then did hill workout on Wednesday. Easy run today. I did a double today because my son's in a, a run club and they only, they just run like, he runs like two miles. It's like mm -hmm. in base building phase right now and he's 10. So mm -hmm. we run about 10 minute pace for 10, 11 minute pace for, we run about 930 pace, but then we take hike breaks about every three quarters of a mile. And we ran like 2.2 miles this evening, um, right before dark. But I ran a, a, an easy seven, you know, at lunchtime. Definitely. So, yeah, I used to do those uh, block um, block miles. Um, you know, sometime I end up doing like a 30, 40 miles for a 100 mile training. Is that something advisable? Or in one run, I used to do 40 miles. But but is that something, should I be doing that? Or, or is it a... Is it a block mile? I like those block miles because then you can be with the family or do other things. And, you know, you know, always, you know, you just chop those hours. So go ahead. I think you have, I think you have less injury risk to do it in a block training style um, versus the one big run. I was just having this discussion with one of my athletes on a, on a coaching call today. And um, we were kind of discussing the difference between like doing block training and doing a one single longer run. And he's newer. He's, he's, he's new to ultras. And, and so we decided that we're going to do both. We, we're kind of doing one weekend where we're doing kind of block training. Then we're kind of giving him a recovery week with lower volumes, just one long run. And then the next week we were going to do a, a 30 mile long run because he's still trying to figure out his nutrition. And I feel like hmm. you, you can't really, as you know, you can't trust, tr tr you can't test your nutrition until you go long. Yeah, you have because to you can go do four and five hour runs all day long and never have any stomach issues. But once you go seven or eight, you're like, oh, oh yeah, this whatever <laughs> I'm doing. So yeah. and you're laughing, and I know you you know exactly what I'm talking I've about. Been there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you don't know until you go longer, and so a lot of times things that might work in a four or five hour run don't work in an eight or nine hour run. So when you go to that 50 mile distance or 100k distance you know, you're, he's getting ready for 50 miler and he's never done 50 miles. So he has no idea whether his, whether his nutrition is going to work or not. Um, he knows what he's tried and it's worked so far, but that's only up to about four hours. Mm. So, um, we're, we're definitely planning that into the training cycle as he builds to this 50 miler just to test his gut, um, to make sure there's no, you know, road bumps. So I think there are, there is, I did a lot more longer training runs when I, in the early days when I was still trying to figure out my nutrition. Once I yeah. figured out kind of my nutritional protocol, 
I don't. I feel like I don't need the 30, 40 milers very often. I, I I'd rather race myself into shape. Um, where I, I, I strategically put carrots of races on the schedule to, as I build up to a bigger race, you know, um, and then and then get ready, you know. And, and I've run enough hundreds the last few years where I'm running like three or four a year that I'm always not, no more than like two months away from like running 100. So I always have all this like base, big fitness. So I, I, I don't feel like I need those long runs, those 30, 40 miles. Um, I'd rather do them in volume blocks. And like you said, it's a lot easier on the family to, you know, I'm not gone the entire day. I might just be gone till noon on, on a Saturday instead of being gone till five. Definitely. Yeah. One of the thing, um, the reason I laugh is because I can do 25 mile, no problem. My, my, um, even when I run races and my wall comes down when I do is 30 plus mile and i found that out also when i was training also i came with 30 plus mile i was like i have to go to that 33 mile or 35 miles because that's when yeah things start falling falling apart for me you know and and it happens on the race day so i always try to get at least one run try to figure my nutrition and try to figure that out so definitely that's been an interesting talk uh, i know we have gone over and you have spent so much time with me to talk uh um, so thanks for coming to Emron's podcast. Before we close, I still want you to give you some words of advice to all the runners out there. That you know, runners they want to be um, you know hundred mile or hold that buckle or or just want to start an ultra. Give, give us a give us a words of advice um, and tell us uh, about the nutrition training that aspect of uh, of a hundred mile or, or ultra distance running. Give give us give us a words of advice. I think uh, no matter where you're coming from, um, you know, consistency is the most important piece of training versus one specific workout. So I'd rather see my runners, you know, instead of running three days a week, an hour and a half longer runs and then being a little beat up for a day or two and then and then getting another run in. I'd rather see them run 30 or 40 minutes every day or, or six days a week and then one long run and build and never build your volume more than 10 10 to 15 percent a week. So look at your overall volume of time on feet, and then and and figure out what's 10 about 10 percent of that, and don't build more than 10 percent. Now, if you have 20 years of experience in running, you can build 15 or 20 percent in sometimes, but most people are going to do great on about 10 percent of volume build a week. So I think first you you know aerobic aerobic base is king too. So always start with aerobic base. If you've taken time off or you're coming off the couch, you know, spend eight weeks of doing aerobic running, no faster running, mm. just build your volume strategic. Like I said, 10% a week, build it up till you're up to running kind of base mileage. Um, you know, that, that typical protocol of, you know, about an hour, hour maintenance runs during the week. And then that one long run a week, um, to build up to it and then build in some volume blocks three, five, and seven weeks out from your target event. Definitely. That's great words of advice. Um, before we close this interview, uh, do you still take athlete, uh, as a, as a coach or, or, or if anybody wants to contact you, how, how can, how can they, um, I, I am, you know, it's the beginning of the season and we're, we're, we're getting pretty full now. Um, I, I have a couple slots left, but I'm, I'm kind of getting to the point where I'm about ready to put a note on my website that says full for the season. <laughs> uh, so we are approaching um, our kind of uh, max roster at the moment, but we're, we're, we're not quite full. So, um, you know, I'm usually full by, by March. Um, so uh, we're working on expanding the business a little bit though, because we've had really good response and I really appreciate all the business out there that people have given me. Um, and I love to share my knowledge and my 22 years of, of experience. So, um, and, and how to balance it with life, you know, cause I've, i I know how it is to work and train and have a family and, and try to juggle all those balls in the air. So, um, anyway, yes, we are still taking some athletes right now, but we are nearing maximum capacity for 2022. Definitely. I will uh, put that in our show note, uh, any, if anybody's interested. So so definitely uh, please uh, check Jeff out. Uh, Jeff, yeah, you, 
my website. It'll I always always have a note if if it's if it's full, I'll have a note on there. What is your website? GoBroncoBilly.com. There we go. We'll put that on the link as well. Thanks for coming to Imran's podcast and talk to me. Um, uh, it's we're hour ten minute into it now, so <laughs> so so thanks for thanks for coming and uh, hopefully we'll see you get here again in in Alabama running uh, Blood Rock. We'll make the course harder, even harder next time. I'll make it. <laughs> tell David. <laughs> well, I really I really appreciate the, appreciate it, and I and thanks for having me on. Um, I always love coming to Alabama. It's always good. Like that Southern hospitality is always alive and well in Birmingham. So um, take care, and uh, uh, I really appreciate the time. Thank you. Thanks for your time. Okay.